Murphy. Brought to you by Dodge. Grab life by the horns. Hi there, everybody. This is Bob Murphy welcoming you to the first regular season game in the history of the New York Mets. Tonight, the New York Mets meet the St. Louis Cardinals right here in St. Louis. Hello, everybody. I'm Fran Healy, and welcome to Happy Recap, the story of a Hall of Fame broadcaster. During the course of the show, we'll take an up-close and personal look at an original Met who has detailed more than 6,000 games across half a century. His cheerful voice has become part of a summer soundtrack that is New York City baseball. But one of the Big Apple's most recognizable voices actually originated in the nation's heartland. Murph, what was it like growing up in Oklahoma? Oh, I was fun. I loved it. My gosh, uh, in those days, the city wasn't very large. Go to school when you had to, of course. <laughs> if you didn't really have to, you didn't go. <laughs> now, we had a good time. We enjoyed it. Were sports a major part of your childhood? And who did you follow? And who did you root for as a kid? When I was going to junior high school, we had a couple of good coaches, and all sports were important, so everybody kind of got involved with it. As far as having uh, idols to root for, we didn't have many. On, at a major league level, uh, the Cardinals were the team that ever, everybody in Oklahoma rooted for, so you got to know the Cardinal stars, and you stayed with them. Did you have aspirations of becoming an athlete or aspirations of becoming a broadcaster? Uh, neither one, especially a broadcaster. That didn't come till much later. That came during my Marine Corps days later on. But in the early days, it was just a, a matter of playing games. I, I wanted to be involved with the sports, whether it was football or baseball or whatever it was. I was so darn small, I kind of got left out as far as football was concerned. What broadcasters had an impact on your life, and what did you learn listening to them? Interesting thing about that, Fred, is most guys my age who started when I do, the one thing you didn't have, you didn't have any listening experience. Today's announcers all have grown up listening to announcer after announcer, borrowed from some, taken from others. But when I first started out, I had no listening experience at all. And that made it tough, because you kind of had to figure out how to do it. You went to the University of Tulsa. What were your college days like? Well, the college days, I, I went to the University of Tulsa at the GI Bill of Rights after I got discharged from the Marine, Marine Corps. So it was a pretty hectic time. Everybody was getting back into school on the GI Bill. I also had a job at the post office. So I'd go to college, and then I'd work for the post office. When I got my first baseball broadcasting job, it was with Muskogee of the Class C Western Association. It was 45 miles from Tulsa University. So I'd get my, I'd schedule my classes for in the morning. About 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be through, get in my car, drive to Muskogee, do a baseball game that night, and then drive back. It was, a, it was hectic, but it was fun. You were in the U.S. Marines, as you mentioned. Tell us about those days. Oh, yeah. The Marine Corps was fun for me. My brother and I both were in the Marine Corps. Jack, of course, was a war correspondent. And I, I was in the Marine Air Corps. I got in there quite fortunately. And I wound up as a navigator in the Marine Air Corps, flying on transport planes in the South Pacific. So it was an, an interesting experience. How did you get your start as a sportscaster? Well, that was after the war, that, after I came home from uh, the Marine Corps. And uh, my brother had a friend who was a promoter in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he introduced me to a guy named Grail Hallett, who later became an executive uh, in the minor leagues. And I somehow got the job in Muskogee, Oklahoma, doing those trip to the class, what was class C then, doing those games. And before the season was over, I had a chance to do the Tulsa Oilers. So I made a promotion from Muskogee to Tulsa, and Tulsa was terrific. That was a Texas League town. It was then, it still is, and a great baseball city. You mentioned your brother Jack. 
What, Im what kind of an impact did he have on your career? Oh, a tremendous impact. He's, he's the one who kept saying, go get him, Bob. Get in there and, and work hard and do the best you can do. Let's see if this thing will work out. And yeah, I got, the more I did it, the more interested I became. And uh, it was just a funny experience. And I, mean, I would say after the first year of doing radio, I, I was convinced that's what I wanted to do. You called other sports. Is baseball your first love? Yeah, my first love by far, no doubt about it. Murph, what is it about baseball that captures the imagination of the American public? Oh, I don't know. I think it's because radio was, came along long before television. People got used to listening to a baseball game on the radio, and they really liked it. The pacing was just right. They could listen outside the yard. They could listen any place they wanted to listen, but taking a radio along. And it was just a natural. Baseball and radio were absolutely made for each other. You mentioned how you worked in the minor leagues. Was that real tough work, or was it enjoyable? Oh, it was enjoyable. It was hard work, but it was certainly enjoyable, no doubt about that. And, of course, I was in Oklahoma, so the summers were really hot weather, hot weather times. But uh, you look forward to getting to that ballpark every night, doing a ball game, and getting back home. Frank Cash had always said, the wonderful thing about baseball, there's always another game tomorrow. I remember when I was a young broadcaster, and yes, I was a young broadcaster at one in time, many years ago with the Houston Astros before I joined the Philadelphia Phillies, and I always look forward to coming to Shea Stadium to see Bob Murphy and Ralph Kiner, because those two were so helpful and encouraging to young broadcasters. Murphy has certainly been a credit to the New York Mets, to Major League Baseball, and to our profession. Now you'll be spending time at home with joy. Joy's gain is our loss. You're a Hall of Famer in every way. God bless and keep you well. It's hit hard to left center field. It's going to be a base hit. A base hit by Jimmy Qualls, and it breaks up the perfect game. Now ah, the applause for Tom Seaver. Eight and one third innings of perfect baseball. Like the ball players he covered, Bob Murphy made the jump from the minors to the majors. And once in the big leagues, he never looked back. Some Mets fans may be surprised to learn that Bob was the voice of both the Red Sox and Orioles before becoming an original Met. Murphy were called to the big leagues in 1954. I know as players, when they're called up, they had the butterflies, the, the, the pregame jitters. Did you get that? Oh, of course, no doubt about it. It was Kurt Gowdy who offered me my first opportunity in the major leagues. Kurt had worked in Oklahoma. He had been in Oklahoma City and had gone to New York to work with Bill Allen. And then after about five years of that, uh, there was an opening in Boston with the Red Sox, and Kurt took that. Then later on, an opening, an opening occurred with Kurt, and I auditioned for that, and I won that audition. So here I was, leaving Oklahoma and heading for Boston. And with that Oklahoma accent of mine, I didn't have much chance. You mentioned the accent. What has been the allure to New York of the accent, like Oklahoma, the southern accent, some great announcers that achieved high success? Oh, when I first came to New York, I worked very hard trying to get rid of my accent because I felt like I had to get more to a Midwestern style, which is kind of free of accents. I don't think I ever was able to completely do that, but at least I cleaned it up to the point where the, uh, the fans were no longer critical of it. Were the fans critical when you first? When I, when I first came to Boston, they were. But coming to Boston is different than coming to New York. When you go to Boston, they have their own way of speaking there. So they're a little critical of people who sound like real outsiders. In Boston, you broadcast the Red Sox when Ted Williams was in his prime. Was he the greatest hitter you've ever seen? Oh, yeah, best I ever saw. I remember when Kurt Gowdy hired me to come to Boston, one of the first things he said to me was, you're going to see the greatest hitter who ever lived. And he was, of course, talking about Ted Williams. And the first time I ever saw Ted, in the spring of 54, on the first day of spring training, he took a fall and broke his collarbone and he would be out for all of spring training and did not return until about a month into the season playing Detroit. They had a doubleheader at Tiger Stadium, and the first t time that Ted played, he went eight for nine, I think it was, with two home runs, 
The only time they got him out, Al Kaline climbed the fence and took a home run away from him. He's the greatest hitter I ever saw. Murph, tell us how you got from the Boston Red Sox to the Baltimore Orioles. Well, in Boston, of course, I was an assistant to Kurt Gowdy. I was there for six years, and Ernie Harwell, a marvelous baseball broadcaster, was doing the Oriole games. He decided to leave Baltimore and go to Detroit. He went to Detroit and stayed there about 45 years. When there was an opening in Baltimore, Kurt Gowdy called me and he said, Kid, you've got to audition for this job. He said, I don't want you to leave, but by the same token, if you're going to broadcast in the big leagues, you got to want to go as far as you could go. So now go audition for this job. Well, I did, and luckily I got the job, so away I went to Baltimore. You spent two seasons with the Baltimore Orioles. What was that like? Well, I love that because Lee McPhail was there as the general manager of the club. The late Paul Richards was the field manager of the team. Lee McPhail was just marvelous to work with. I never met a better guy in baseball than Lee McPhail. And that two years with Baltimore, for the first time, the Orioles had a good ball club. And they had a guy named Jim Gentile playing first base. Big left-handed slugger. He could really hit him. We had a doubleheader in Minnesota one year. And uh, Gentile, his first two times in bat, hit home runs. The third time he came to bat, it, you couldn't believe it. But he was taken out by Paul Richards for a pitch hitter because he was platooning at that position. He had Walt Dropo, a right-hand hitter, playing first base, and Gentile, a left-hand hitter. So after back-to-back -back home runs, Gentile gets taken out, and up comes Dropo. Murph, in 1962, you were up against 200 other applicants for the New York Met job. What was that like? That was quite a contest. I knew that. I found out later that, number one, they were looking for somebody with a national reputation. That turned out to be Lindsey Nelson. They wanted a former National League home run hitter, if possible. That turned out to be Ralph Kiner. And they wanted somebody with experience of doing everyday, play-by-play, -play Major League Baseball. Well, I, by then, I'd had eight years, six years in Boston and two years in Baltimore. So I sent in an audition to qualify for that. And fortunately for me, I won the audition. So when I won that, I was really thrilled. This is an open letter to Bob Murphy, care of the New York Mets, Shea Stadium in New York. Dear Bob, like all of your other friends, I took your announcement of retirement with mixed emotions. I was happy, of course, that you and Joy would spend many more hours together, having been deprived, having suffered so many separations in a life of baseball. And I'm thrilled for you that that would come about. But I'm also sad that it means I will not be seeing you again on a regular basis. Bob, as I'm sure you know, you're very fortunate to have had the Mets all these years. And the Mets and their fans are so very fortunate to have had you. You serve the Mets and their fans with distinction and with class. You're a Hall of Famer. You're a big leaguer on and off the field. And so my prayers for you and Joy would be for many, many wonderful years in your retirement. I'm going to miss you, pal. With love and affection, sincerely yours, Vin Scully, Dodgers. Ground ball, hit the shortstop. Carlson to Weiss, there's one. From Don Ossie to Don Zimmer, Bob Murphy has seen and announced all of the 700-plus players that have worn the Mets uniform over 42 seasons. As the friendly, informative voice from our televisions and radios, Bob has guided us through every critical moment in franchise history. All of a sudden, you get a job for an expansion team in 1962. What was it like working for an expansion team? We, we enjoyed it. We had a good time. Ralph Lindsay and I came together, and the three of us just immediately were getting along great. First thing we decided we wanted to do was to get to know Casey Stingle, one of the great names in the history of baseball. Well, the first spring training was down in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we said to ourselves, let's, stay, let's hang around with Casey and find out what makes him tick. You can't hang around with Casey, or you couldn't then. He's too strong for you. So we'd go to the ball game, work the game, then we'd go out with Casey that night, stay out half the night, 
the last thing he'd say to you was, I'll see you at 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast. After we'd been there for 10 days, we were trying to hide behind the potted palms in order to get away from him. The Mets went out and they lost 120 ball games their first year. What was that like? Because the fans loved the team. Well, you didn't expect to win, so it wasn't, wasn't shocking to you when you lost the ball game. You do darn well before the season started. You're probably going to lose at least 100 games, and the Mets did that very well. The interesting thing about the season, because of Casey Stingle and a very distinguished coaching staff, uh, it was easy just to stand around and talk baseball and think about the future and things getting better. And the, interestingly enough, the Mets had a pretty good hitting ball club that first year. They could score runs, but they couldn't pitch at all. So every day they'd be ahead, it seemed like five or six runs in the middle of a game, and you'd say, hey, we might win one here today. <laughs> but you wouldn't win one. They didn't have anybody to pitch out of the bullpen. You worked with Ralph Kiner and Lindsey Nelson. What are your memories of Lindsey Nelson? Oh, there's many memories of Lindsey Nelson. One of the main things to remember about Lindsey Nelson was his memory. It was remarkable. He was a very active guy in World War II in Europe as a PR man, a captain. Remembered everything that happened to him during those years. And it was fun to be with him and to hear him talk about his experiences in the Army in World War II. You worked with a legendary baseball player in Ralph Kiner. What oh, yeah. was that like? I loved it. Still do. Ralph Kiner is just marvelous. He has, Ralph Kiner has the best disposition of any former player I've ever known. He will spend more time signing autographs and pleasing young fans than any former player you've ever seen. He's just terrific to be around, so understanding. When he, when he stopped playing, he became a general manager in San Diego, California. And that was interesting because my brother was the lead, leading sports writer in San Diego. Now Ralph becomes the general manager of the San Diego Coast League minor league ball team, and they became pretty close friends. In 1962, the Mets were a brand new organization. They lost 120 games. Seven years later, they're on top of the world. Could you believe it? It was hard to believe it, really was. I remember in spring training the year of the championship season, a guy I just loved, Gil Hodges. I was talking with Gil at the end of spring training, and I asked him, Gil, how many games can this team win? And he thought about it for a moment. He said, well, maybe this team might win 85 games. Well, that was an awful lot of ball games right there. And he thought about it for another minute. He said, now, isn't that funny? If I really feel that way, if I really feel that this team can win 85 games, why can't I figure out a way to win another five or 10 and be in the postseason. By golly, he did it. What was Gil Hodges like as a manager and a man? He was terrific both ways. The players on that 69 team playing for Gil Hodges, they just loved him. He was firm, but he was fair. And he was a terrific manager. Every move he made seemed to work out just right. You've often said that the 69 Mets hold a special place in your heart. Oh, that's true. Why? They were special people. Those people, even today, those that are still alive and doing well, are still the very best of friends. They were terrific friends on that ball club, and they had so much camaraderie, and they also had talent. So, but the Tom Seavers and the Jerry Kuzman and the Jerry Grodys, those guys were just marvelous to be around. It was a miraculous season for the New York Mets. Indeed. Why? Well, because they were coming together. At the beginning of the year, there was nothing there that told you, hey, this team might win. But it was getting better every day that you watched them play. And I remember we were in San Francisco in the middle of the season, and I had lunch with Don Cardwell. And while we were having lunch, Cardi said to me, Bob, you know something? I said, what? He said, I think we can win this thing. I couldn't believe that. In the middle of the season, here are those bets that nobody ever heard of as far as winning is concerned, and now Cardwell says we can win this thing. Lo and behold, they did. Did you think the black cat played any part in that <laughs> championship season? It was fun to talk about it. <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with the outcome, but it was fun to talk about it, no doubt about that. You never had the pleasure of calling, and this is incredible, a no-hitter for the New York Mets. No, not for the Mets. What was it like with Seaver's almost perfect game? Uh, that broke my heart when he, not once, but about three times, came so close to a no-hitter. Not to get it, that was really heartbreaking, no doubt about it. And after Seaver left the New York Mets 
and went to Cincinnati, lo and behold, he pitches a no-hitter. The Mets seemed to play good baseball when they took on the Western Division teams that year. Oh, they did, yes. Tell us about that. Well, they played, when they played the Dodgers and when they played the Giants, they just stepped up their game, and they played much, much better. And when the Dodgers came to New York, that was always a big moment in baseball for the New York Mets because they're playing at home and the Dodgers are back in town. It was The same was true with the Giants, but more so with the Dodgers. That meant more to the fans of the New York Mets. With their success against the Western Division teams, could you and the Mets taste the champagne? Oh, not really. You can't, you can't be sure of anything. This darn game of baseball, even if you're a dominant team, you still can't be sure of anything until it's all over. How strange was it when you had the playoffs before the World Series? Well, that was 1969, and obviously it was an exciting time. I remember the Mets got to the playoffs. They're going to play the Atlanta Braves. They go down to Atlanta to play. The Braves had a great hitting ball club with Henry Aaron, and the best hitter in baseball that year was a man named Rico Cardi. And when the Mets won the series and beat Atlanta, they did so because a young guy by the name of Nolan Ryan came out of the Mets bullpen to face Rico Cardi. Yes, he got him out, and the Mets went on to win. Murph, in 1969, the Baltimore Orioles were heavily favored over the New York Mets. Tell us your memories of that World Series. Well, the Orioles were heavy favorites to win that World Series. I don't think too many people involved with the Mets thought the Mets could upset Baltimore. And when, especially they opened in Baltimore, the Orioles win the first game of the series, and they beat the best pitcher on the Mets staff, Tom Seaver. So it wasn't looking good at all, but you know who was terrific? Jerry Kuzman was terrific. So was Gary Gentry. Everybody involved was terrific. And all of a sudden, the Mets were winning the World Series. They went four in a row, and it's all over. And I think everybody was surprised. It was the, and That's why it's still called the Amazons and their amazing story, the story of 1969 baseball. What was it like for you, who broadcast the Orioles, in the first World Series the Mets are involved in, played against your old team? Oh, I was rooting for those Mets like you can't believe. After all, I'd been with the Mets since their first year, so you wanted the Mets to win so bad. You didn't really think they could do it, but yes, they could do it, and they did do it, and we loved it. The fans and really the city of New York got heavily involved. They were absorbed in that World Series. Yeah, tell they us, were. Tell us about the atmosphere at that time. Oh, the atmosphere was electric. The town was just absolutely standing. If, if you went into Manhattan and you walked down the streets, every time you passed a television store or a store that had television sets on, Crowds were gathering so they could watch and see what the Mets were doing. And the Mets were doing everything just right. That particular year, the miraculous defense the Mets put on the field, do you have any memories about that defense? Oh, certainly. I remember Tommy H. He's so very well. The late Tommy was a marvelous defensive outfielder. So was Ron Swoboda. Swoboda was even better than we thought he could possibly be. He made two unbelievable catches in right center field to help the Mets upset Baltimore. Murph, what went through your mind when Davey Johnson hit that fly ball to left field and Cleon Jones caught it and went to one knee? Well, like everybody else, he'll read it for those New York Mets. I said, my goodness, they've won the World Series. It was incredible. What a marvelous moment. What did the Mets championship in 1969 mean to New York? It brought New York alive. The whole city was alive with the amazing championship posted by Gil Hodges at the New York Mets. John Lindsay probably profited more than anybody else. He got reelected as mayor of New York, and at the time when he was considered to be probably number three in the, in the race. But now he became the mayor again, and everybody was riding with the New York Mets. The, the parade downtown, the ticker tape parade was marvelous. Everything about it was just perfect. <laughs> The 3-2 delivery, the runner goes, and a little pop-up. Milner grabs it. He'll run to first. Double play. The Mets win the pennant. The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. After 69, four years later, the Mets were back in the thick of things again. What ingredients went into that team? That's hard to believe. In 73... It was such a strange season for the New York Mets. They were in last place most of the year. They wound up winning it all, 
in one month after the famous cry of Tug McGraw, you got to believe. But the Mets had good pitching. You've always heard that good pitching will stop good hitting. Well, the Mets in 73, just like they did in 69, had outstanding pitching, and it held them up. As a matter of fact, when they went into the playoffs, they won the National League East on the Monday following Sunday, the last day of the season. And they were going to play Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a dynasty-type team, a dynasty-type. So the Mets go in and knock them off. Beautiful pitch, pitching in that series. John Matlack turned in a marvelous game. Matlack was such fun to watch because he had great style and he knew how to pitch. But the Mets uh, beat Cincinnati, and they were ahead of Oakland three games to two in the World Series. Going back to Oakland, they lost the last two games and lost the series four games to three. So they played two dynasty teams. The Reds were a dynasty team, and the Oakland A's were a dynasty team. The Mets beat one and almost beat the other. Was Tug McGraw's resurrection the thing that saved the Mets in 1973? Yeah, you'd have to say so. Donald Grant had made the visit to the clubhouse trying to spur the team on, and when he left, uh, Tug McGraw had yelled, you got to believe, and that became the slogan, the standby phrase. Lo and behold, the Mets win that thing, and they won it in the last day of the season. As a matter of fact, it went to Monday, a day after Sunday's last day of the season, before they actually won it, and they were going on to play a dynasty team in Cincinnati. And yes, Tug McGraw had kind of carried them along. At what moment did Bob Murphy believe in 1973? I think after it was all over, really. <laughs> that was a, a, a terrible year for the Mets. They kept losing month after month after month after month, and now they get to the last day of August, and they're dead last in the National League East. So they win the whole thing in the final month of the season. It was really hard to believe. In 1973, in the playoffs, there was a very memorable moment at Shea Stadium. It was like a boxing match between Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson. Tell us about it. Well, a fight broke out is what happened, <laughs> and it broke out at second base. And Pete Rose was a much more imposing physical guy. He's, although he wasn't real tall, he was powerfully built. Buddy Harrelson, of course, as frail as he could be, tried to keep his weight up to 150 pounds, but when Buddy had to go into battle, he was ready to go. And we had quite a fight there at second base, no doubt about it. When you think of championship teams, you think of key pieces to the puzzle. The Mets resurrected their franchise again in the mid-80s. What were the key pieces to that team? Oh, Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter and Doc Gooden, of course. When Doc Gooden arrived, he just about saved baseball for the New York Mets. He came on the scene, and he was so good, you just couldn't believe it. How is Davey Johnson different than, say, Gil Hodges? Well, Gil Hodges was more old-school baseball type. Davey Johnson was a modern, new type of guy who believed and believed in computerized baseball. Where Gil Hodges was one of the old-school guys that everybody just loved, you know. He didn't uh, count the pitches. If you'd thrown 100 pitches, that didn't mean you came out of the game. What Gil Hodges saw and determined whether you came out of the game or not. Murph, how important was the dual leadership on the Mets in 86 with Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez? They somehow made it all work out together very, very well. And I'll never forget, or any other Mets fan will never forget, when they were playing the Astros in the 86 postseason series, when Jesse Orozco was worn out on the mound, how Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter converged at the mound, and they said, look, if anybody throws a breaking ball, there's going to be a fist fight right out here. So the Mets went on to win it. Jesse Orozco, who was just completely wiped out, managed somehow to win that game. He won three of that postseason series, and the Mets were on their way to Boston. What were the pivotal moments of the 1986 season? Well, it all came down to one moment in Houston, Texas, where the Mets, if they had to go one more game, would have to face Mike Scott. Scott had already beaten them twice. They probably would not have gotten to go to the World Series if they had not won that game six and they pulled that game out. They tied it in the ninth inning, and then went ahead of the 14th. Houston tied it again. Finally, in the 16th inning, the Mets won the ball game, and they're going to play in the World Series. What is your recollection of the 1986 World Series between the New York Mets and the Boston Red Sox? Well, I remember Sid Fernandez, I remember. He turned that series around. The Mets lost the first two games of the series at Shea. Now they're going to Fenway Park, and you've always heard all your life how it's a graveyard for left-hand pitching. It didn't turn out to be that. 
The guy who saved that series for the New York Mets was Sid Fernandez. He did it in a tremendous relief role and wound up as one of the stars of the series, along with Bobby Ojeda. What was it like for Bob Murphy to return to Fenway Park? Oh, that was fun. I liked that a lot. I always loved working at Fenway Park the years I was there. Such a friendly ballpark to be in. So uh, confined, so such a tight, intimate little situation. But yeah, I enjoyed it, and I look forward to going there with the New York Mets. One of the greatest games of this franchise, the New York Mets franchise, is game six in that World Series. Tell us about that. Well, the interesting thing about the ball that Buki hit down the first baseline that got by Billy Buckner, Buki will tell you to this day that he thought he was going to beat that out for an infield hit. And also, there was no pressure on Mookie, according to Mookie, because the tying run had already scored on a wild pitch. So that part was not putting pressure on Mookie Wilson. So when that ground ball got by Bill Buckner and uh, Ray Knight came around to score, yeah, the Mets had it won. It was a fun moment, and a moment that will be replayed time and time and time again during Mets history. Second World Series championship for the Mets while Bob Murphy was a broadcaster. How sweet was the first one, and how sweet was the second one? Well, the second one was sweet, but I have to say the first one was the sweetest of them all. They always say that your first is the best. I guess that's probably true. The Mets, like all major league teams, have had their peaks and their valleys. How does that affect Bob Murphy as an announcer? Well, you, well, you prefer the peaks to the valleys, I will certainly tell you that. The valleys are kind of hard to handle. You have to remind yourself that you're a reporter. You're sitting there behind that microphone trying to report it just like you would if you had a typewriter. So it is, if, if, whereas if you're winning, uh, every moment is kind of magnified and becomes a happy time for fans of the New York Mets. Why, whereas when the team is losing, the fans are not very happy at all. With all your happy recaps, did you ever make a mistake after a loss and say, we'll be right back with the happy recap? No, I didn't make that mistake, but I'm surprised I didn't. I made every other mistake. <laughs> Jesse Arasco, the dream has come true. In 1984, Bob Murphy was inducted into the Mets Hall of Fame along with colleagues Ralph Kiner and Lindsey Nelson. A decade later, he reached the pinnacle of his profession when he was enshrined at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York as the Ford C. Frick award winner. In 1994, you were inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. What was that like? I enjoyed that a lot. My family and close friends were all there. It was a happy day at Cooperstown. It's always a hot day. It's always, the weather's always so terribly hot. But it was a, an experience I'll never forget. And I was delighted that Ralph Kiner was there and Ralph was going to be part of the induction process because Ralph had been in the Hall of Fame for 25 years, he had gone in 1975. And among Hall of Famers, Ralph Kiner is distinguished as one of the truly outstanding Hall of Famers. But everything about the ceremony was marvelous. Murph, what is the most important ingredient in the success of a Major League Baseball team? I think the ownership of the team, Fred. The Mets have been very, very fortunate. They've had terrific ownership. In the beginning, it was Joan Payson. Joan Payson was a marvelous lady to be around. She was so good to the ball club, she loved her players. And later on, one of the owners of the Mets was her daughter, Linda Derule. And she was terrific, and her daughters were terrific, very involved. Ownership has always been there with the New York Mets, including Nelson Doubleday and Fred Wellpond. And the, the current ownership of the ball club is truly outstanding, and they'll do very, very well. Who is the greatest pitcher you've ever seen? I'm going to say Tom Seaver because you knew when Tom Seaver went to that mound, you were going to see an outstanding ball game, and he rarely ever failed you. Time and time and time again, he'd go out to that mound and wind up with a three, four, or five hitter and a victory for the New York Mets. Who was the greatest hitter you've ever seen? Greatest hitter I ever saw was Ted Williams. He could just almost predict exactly what he was going to do. In later years, one of the best hitters to watch has been Mike Piazza 
who's a marvelous hitter, no doubt about it. But Ted Williams has to rank as number one among my all-time list. Other than Shea, what was your favorite Major League ballpark? Boy, that's a good question. I think Dodger Stadium. I think Dodger Stadium. Of course, things keep changing with the new ballparks that are opening up year after year after year, but Dodger Stadium still looks brand new, doesn't it? It really does. How has the broadcasting of Major League Baseball changed since you started? Well, the main way it has changed is that you, you have to pay more attention. You have to work harder to stay abreast of everything that's happening there. So many changes are being made. So many players are being used. So much media coverage that so much is available to a broadcaster to sit down and read and study before he actually goes into the ball game. You need to spend at least a two, two and a half hours to prepare yourself to do a broadcast of a major league game. What will you miss most about broadcasting? Just not being in the ballpark. Just not being in the ballpark. I love being in a ballpark, watching a major league baseball game. I'm gonna miss it, no doubt about it. Murph, as far as bizarre games or bizarre moments in Mets history, what about the game in Philadelphia when you ended the game? Oh, that was bizarre. There's no doubt about that. Mets were ahead 10-3 to in the ninth inning, and they almost blew the ball game as the Phillies kept scoring run after run after run. Finally, a wicked line drive by Tommy Hurd was caught. The Mets had won the ball game by a single run of the ninth inning, and that's the day I remember I said, the Mets have finally won the damn thing. <laughs> Did that just pop out? It just popped out. It was an honest comment. Ball players got a kick out of it. They enjoyed it. Murph, over the years, you have broadcast so many baseball games, and New York Mets fans think of Met baseball. They think of Bob Murphy and Bob Murphy's voice. Do you ever think about that? No, not really. Man, I just think about how wonderful Met fans have been. You're driving around town, just pull into a gas station, fill up the tank of your car. Some guy hears your voice and said, hey, you're the guy that does the miss. And you say, oh, yeah, that's nice of you to remember that. Now, it's fun. It's, it's been terrific, and the fans just couldn't be better. How did the happy recap come about? You know, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think I may have uh, first heard it from Herb Carneal, but I'm not sure. I just don't remember. I know I used it for a while, and I thought, hey, that's pretty corny. So I said, I'll stop using it, and I did, I did stop. But strangely enough, I got quite a bit of mail saying, hey, we like it when you say that. So I said, okay, I'll put it back in for a while. So I put it back in, and the fans seemed to like it, so it stayed in. If you had, had the ability to speak directly to all of your fans, what would you tell them? Thank you. Thank you. It's been a wonderful ride. I've enjoyed it. I love you, and I thank you. 50 years of excellence behind the microphone. That is the legacy of Bob Murphy. And for generations of Mets fans, his golden voice will forever be synonymous with summer swings and autumn glories. And so, with a tip of the cap to Bob and one of his signature phrases, thank you for joining us for this very happy recap. This is Bob Murphy welcoming you to the first regular season game in the history of the New York Mets. Tonight, the New York Mets meet the St. Louis Cardinals right here. Two-one pitch. Hit in the air to left field. It's deep. Back goes Jones by the fence. It hits the top of the fence. Comes back in play. Jones grabs it. The relay throw to the plate. They may get him. He's out. He's out at the plate. Now the stretch by McGraw. The 3-2 delivery. The runner goes. And a little pop-up. Milner grabs it. Have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. And a high fly ball into the right field. It is fairly deep. It's way back by the wall. He did it! It's a home run! A home run! The Mets win the ball game! Dykstra hits a home run! Lenny Dykstra being mobbed by his teammate. Swing and a miss! Swing and a miss! Struck him out! Struck him out!
rebound. Mets win it. The Mets have won it. They're in the World Series. Going, yeah, there it goes. Mike Piazza, a three run homer. Here's the pitch. Swung, lined hard, caught. The game is over. The Mets win it. They're on their way to Arizona. A wicked line drive hit by Dimitri Young, caught by Edgardo Alfonso. The game is over. The Mets have won the wild card in the National League. It's all over. The Mets win it. A one-hit shutout for Bobby Jones, and they're all racing to the mound. And Bobby, Bobby Jones. The pitch by Stanley, and a ground ball trickling. It is a fair ball. Six by Buckner. Rounding third night. The Mets will win the ball game. The Mets win. The dream has come true. The Mets have won the World Series, coming from behind to win the seventh ball game. in just a moment the final score and listen to this the New York Mets 23 the Chicago Cubs 10.